Wow, that's a biggie. Come on up, Jeff. Everybody say, hey, Jeff. Yes, let's do that one time, just to, just to release blessing. Just everybody, blessed are you, Jeff, who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all. And uh, may I, all of you may not have been here last week, but um, I uh, this is the second of a three-part series on the Bride of Christ. And um, when I started this last week, I shared a little bit of the context for me personally is that um, I am on a personal journey of healing. Uh, I'm a, from an attachment style, I'm dismissive, which means that I never really learned how to attach from my parents. And so I replaced uh, connection through relationships with performance. And then when I became a Christian, I just switched that to performing for Jesus. And um, so I'm learning what it means to uh, attach to God and attach to other people. And I would say the, the single most helpful thing that I've done on this journey is to study this issue of Christ and the bride. And what we're going to talk about today is five different levels of intimacy with bride being the highest level of intimacy. And so as I'm learning about my relationship with God, I'm being reparented. He's giving me what I missed out growing up. And so, I'm, uh, God, you know, God is doing his part, and it being in community with others is, is an important part as well. So let me see. I've got a clicker. And, oh, it has an on button. Oh, I see. Great question, Rob. Did you turn it on? Uh, all right. Now I got a blue light. Oh, I point it at the screen? No, just Oh, down. Oh, and okay. All right. Learning curve, first time, uh, inaugural use of the clicker here. Um, so this is a Robert Seebeck picture of Christ and the bride. All right. And uh, you can't read it, but up there it talks, it's a quote of Revelation 19, which is what we looked at last week, which says, uh, Hallelujah, for... The Lord has made himself, the bride has, uh, the wedding has come and the bride has made herself ready. All right. So I'm going to review quickly the uh, kind of some highlights from last week. And uh, we talked about this verse in Ephesians 5 where Christ said that there's a mystery and that mystery is that Christ uh, and the church relationship is this is symbolized in marriage. And so of all the relationships that we have as humans, the most intimate is a relationship between a husband and wife. And so he's taking like of, of that and saying, okay, I... Uh, that is a picture of this relation, the most intimate relationship that you have is a picture of my relationship with you. And, and so uh, that is a beautiful thing. And then we looked at this passage in Ephesians 5 uh, that talks about uh, husband's relationship with their wives Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with the water of his word. And then what I have highlighted here is that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. 
having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And um, so last week, Nathan and Victoria were here, and I talked about her wedding. And Eric, how you walked this beautiful bride down the aisle. And there she was in all of her glory, her father presenting her to Nathan, you know, and he was up there beaming. And, and that is just this wonderful picture of what we're preparing for in our lives is that there's going to be a wedding and someday we are going to be that bride walking down and and the father is going to present us to the son to his son and there will be in all of our glory isn't that I, I mean, it's just such a beautiful picture that God's given us. And so really what, what this life is about is preparing for that day. And this is the verse that Bob quoted in that picture is that uh, the bride has made herself ready and there she is in all of her glory. Uh, then we looked at this verse in, uh, oh, too far, still learn how to use this. We looked at this verse in Genesis 2.18, where it says, God said, it's not good for the man, and he was talking about Adam, to be alone, I will make a helper suitable for him. But since Marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. We can infer from this that uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit were, and, and the Son were together for all eternity. And so I've got kind of this symbol here of the Trinity and the three members of the Trinity. And that in eternity past, they're all having this wonderful relationship of loving and honoring and supporting each other. And they were self-sufficient and full for all eternity past. And then something mysterious happened and, it, and, and there was a realization that there was an incompleteness and the father said to the son, it's not good that you be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for you. And so, and we looked at some verses last week that says, from the foundation of the earth he chose us. So before he even created the universe, I believe that the whole reason he created the universe is to create a context for the bride to live, and that he would give us free will so that it would be meaningful and that we would choose him after he said, I chose you. And that, um, and it's just this amazing thing. So we went from just the Trinity to the Trinity with uh, the father having a daughter-in-law, and that's us. So it's certainly not saying we're members of the Trinity, but by golly, we're an in-law. I mean, this is the closest relationship that we can have. And, and um, uh, then we looked at this verse. Uh, for this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so this is an important thing for marriages, is that a marriage relationship be so intimate 
that no other relationship comes in the way of that. It, 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 you have to leave father and mother in order to create room for this relationship in that in that relationship, there is this level of intimacy and closeness that's unlike any relationship. And so the mystery is that Christ somehow left his father and mother to cleave to his wife, and that's us. And that doesn't take away from Christ's relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit, but what does that say about his relationship with us? That's just amazing. And when Christ became a man, uh, he did not equ- consider equality with God to something to be grasped, it says in Ephesians or Philippians 2. He became a man, and even when he was resurrected, he has a human body. So he left one thing in order to gain this bride. I mean, it's just, it's really amazing. And so uh, the last kind of thing of review, kind of looking again at this uh, chapter, or this passage from Ephesians 5, is that uh, it gives us some insight into what the purpose of our lives is. Why are we here on this planet? What is, all right, so now that we're believers, we're his betrothed, we're fiance, we're not married yet, that's coming. So what is it that our job is? And, And our job is to cooperate with God so that we can be sanctified, that means to be set apart, to be consecrated, to be wholly given to God, cleansed by the washing with the water of the word, so that we might be presented at that wedding in all of our glory. And and that we would have no spot or wrinkle or any blemish but that we be holy and blameless. So it's true that we're already righteous because we're in Christ, and he's given us that gift of righteousness, but yet there is this sanctification process that we're in right now where we are becoming more and more glorious, and, and our destination, our destiny is that someday we're going to be this glorious bride. And, and that's, that speaks of our identity because that is who we are. It's not something that we have to strive to obtain. It's this gift that's already been given to us. And yet, the paradox is we are learning to walk in that. And sometimes there's a gap between who God says we are and where we're at right now. And so we're learning to, uh, that what God says about us, we're learning to say, okay, I'm going to walk that out. That is who I really am. That's, there's this difference when we talk about identity for striving to, I'm not this, but I'm going to try and be that. No, that's not it. We already are glorious. Now we just need to walk that out. So uh, that's a little review of last time. And what I'm going to talk about today is five different levels of intimacy in our relationship with God. So the first one's an outsider. And that's before we're part of God's family Uh, we're not Christians yet, we're on the outside, and then when we first come in, kind of a level of intimacy is that we're a servant. And um, uh, our job as servants is to obey and to do what, you know, the, the role of a servant is there for the pleasure of his master to help him get stuff done. The next level of intimacy is friendship. The next one is a son or a daughter. 
and the, the most intimate of all is fiance. So, um, all right. So, uh, kind of by way of comparison, let's say that you hear about this company that's like the best company ever to work for, and the person that owns the company is, is great, the company has a great culture, people love working there, and, and they're well taken care of. It's the like, if there's anybody in town that you can get a job working for, that's where you want to work. All right. So first you're an outsider, and you go, yeah, but I would, I would love to work for this company. And so maybe you obtain the skills that they're looking for, and then the day you apply, and the day comes like, okay, I'm no longer an outsider, I'm in. I'm an employee. And so what's the job of the employer, an employee? It's to get stuff done so that the owner of the company gets what they want. I mean, that's how it is. It's, it's a transaction. It's like, uh, as an employee, it's like, I'll take care of the employer, and then they take care of me. You know, it's a Nothing wrong with that. That's, uh, it's not re primarily relational. It's primarily a transaction. All right? So another level is that you're a friend of the owner. Okay, so, so as, uh, I have lots of friends that are business owners, and I'll just say, hey, how's it going? You know, what's... What's going on with your company? And, and people will talk about, uh, you know, I've got this problem or I've got this aspiration. And, but you kind of get the inside scoop when you're a friend of the owner that you don't get when you're an employee. All right, when you're an employer, your job, your job is just to get stuff done, not necessarily to know kind of the inside scoop of what's going on. So that's what a friend gets. Okay, so let's say that you are a son or daughter of the owner. Oh, now that's like a whole nother level of uh, knowing what's going on because you do have, you know, you, you have a lot of access to the owner because you're their son or daughter and you're working in the family business and guess what? Someday that might, you're going to inherit that. Okay, so now you're not an employee. You, as, as a son or daughter, that's like a whole nother level of intimacy. But the highest one is if you're married to the owner, right? Because then you're co-owner. And you're involved in all the decisions. I mean, you're, you're, you're co-leading the company with your spouse, and that's the highest, uh, that, that's like a whole nother level of intimacy. And so uh, the thing I would observe about these levels is that they build on each other. So uh, going back to this one. So it's true that we are a servant and will always be a servant, but we can climb up that ladder of intimacy. We can build on it. It's, uh, it's cumulative. Okay, so let's like go and unpack each of these. So as far as being an outsider, uh, Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. The road is wide that leads to destruction, and it's narrow that leads to life. So everybody's invited to uh, be an insider, not an outsider, but not everybody makes that choice. And so, um, uh, hopefully, well, everybody in this room has made that choice, and now we're not, not an outsider, we're inside. So Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle, is a bondservant of God. So so Paul considered himself a servant. 
So what's a servant? A servant is a member of God's household. That's good. Uh, As a member of the household, we're provided for. God protects us. Uh, And we have an opportunity to use the talents that God's given us in a meaningful way to serve. And that's awesome. And, And we're here to adore and worship the king. So these are all things that that you can do um, as a servant. Um, We're his sheep, and we get the good shepherd that is guiding us and protecting us and talking to us, you know. So we get to have this interaction with God where we hear his voice. Uh, The ministering angels are on this level. And what... Some people think is that when Lucifer rebelled against God, what Lucifer could see is that he was going to make men and that, uh, and that we would become his bride in this most intimate place and that he wanted that. But God said, no, as an angel, you don't get that. That is reserved for this bride that I'm going to make. And so the angels only make it up this level to uh, ministering. So uh, the thing I would say about a servant is a servant's job is to obey. So remember I said that These levels build on each other. So it's like when you have young kids that are in maturity, a parent will say, listen, you need to obey me. Uh, Now, if I say that to my wife, that doesn't go over well. Okay, because there's a whole other level of intimacy and respect the further up you get. So on all of these levels, it doesn't take away from obedience, but when you get to be a friend or a son and daughter and a spouse, it's not about obedience. It's about relationship and being one. It's about wanting to, not having to. So let's look at some, a couple scriptures about friends. Jesus said, you are my friend if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. And then here's his definition of friendship. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. Okay, so a friend gets to be part of this gets like the inside scoop on what's going on. And that is is this wonderful thing that God imparts to us. So we looked at this, studied, when I talked about beholding, I talked about this passage a little bit with Moses being an example of this. Whenever Moses entered the tent, when they were out in the desert, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand on the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then in Psalm 103, it contrasts um, kind of this whole, like being a slave versus a friend. It says, he made known his ways to Moses, but his acts to the sons of Israel. So as friend, Moses got to know kind of like the inside scoop of what was on God's heart. But to everyone else who had more of a, of a servant, slave, uh, a servant thing with God, they just got to see what God did. So, um, so that's a little bit on friendship. Now let's go to children couple verses on this. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God as beloved children. 
I love this verse in 1 John 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. So it's almost like, I just love that, and that's what we are. It's like, just like, oh, I got to take a step back and take that in. Isn't that amazing? That is, that's who we are. I love this passage in Romans 8, because in this passage, Paul is contrasting the difference between being a servant or a slave and a son. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ. So this is this amazing thing about being a child is we get this inheritance. Uh, now, here's the part about this verse that I don't like at all. The last part of that it says, oh, this whole thing about uh, receiving this inheritance, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. Okay, so we all like the whole thing of us being presented in our glory. That's wonderful. How, do we, how does that happen? Through suffering. Oh, well, that doesn't sound like much fun. And we'll talk about this next week when we kind of talk about some, in a practical way, how do we get ready to be the bride of Christ? But um, just saying, this is what the Bible says, that this whole process of becoming like him does involve suffering. Um, one more thing as children uh, is that as you know, going back to the company example, like if a child has a place in the com company, they've been given authority and they're going to be running the company someday. And so in order to practice taking on this responsibility of running the company and ruling over the company, They've got to have responsibility learning how to do hard things. So they've been delegated authority, and the more ability they have, the more authority that they've been delegated so that they can learn what it takes to run the company. And, and for us, someday as the bride, we're going to be seated on the throne with Christ as his co-regent, as the queen, and we're going to be ruling over the whole universe. I mean, isn't that amazing? And so we have this life, we get to practice ruling and reigning over the purview that God's given us, and that's why suffering and trials and learning to overcome because it says in Revelations 3, to him who overcomes, he will uh, sit with me on my throne. Okay, so let's talk perhaps the most about the, the fiancé, that we're his fiancé, we're his betrothed, and we're going to be his bride. So, this verse that we've looked at several times even this morning in Genesis 2.24 about leaving and cleaving so that they can become one, that's quoted by Jesus when he's talking about divorce. It's quoted by Paul in uh, this passage in 5.31. So, um, 
let's especially focus on the cleaving part. You know, becoming one with Christ. All right, so in this life, we're getting ready for the, the wedding. So what, is that, what does that look like? Okay, so uh, several things that I thought of. One thing is this whole thing of exclusivity. So in a, going back to this picture that he's given us in marriage so that we can understand this mystery better, uh, our hearts, if you're married, our hearts is to be especially sharing what's going on with our spouse. And actually, if somebody is sharing something with me and saying, well, I haven't talked, I haven't been able to talk to my spouse about what I'm sharing with you, I just go, this is not good. This is not good. I mean, how what it should be is that we have such safety in our marriage that that's the one that we're talking to first. That that's the, the one that we can share our hearts with. And that there's this exclusivity in our relationship with Christ that's, that's more than anything else. And there's an exclusivity in Christ's mind, which is a mystery here. But I mean, he, it, the, the whole idea is an intimate sharing of our lives together. And that that is going to happen for all eternity. And so now is the time in this life that we practice that intimate relationship with him. There's a commitment, uh, the securely attached long-term relationship. I mean, that is hesed, where we're committed to each other and we deeply care for each other So that's how it is is in a marriage. Well, in that, all the more with Christ is that there's an increasing level of secure attachment. And so that's that's part of what I'm learning in, in my whole journey is how do I be securely attached to him and just look to him to get all of my needs met. Um. One of the greatest desires that God has placed in us is that we would be known and that we'd have the opportunity to know others. And so, in our relationship with Christ, Christ loves it when we pour out our hearts to him and share with him all that's going on with us. First, before anybody else. And... um, and, and share from the depths of our hearts. And then, similarly, for us to know God and his attributes. And I would say, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit at the end when I talk about marriage, is that I'm increasingly coming to understand that if I really want to uh, in order for me to really know Christ's love for me, I need to be loving other people. And loving other people is hard to do, and it forces me to say, okay, God, how do you love me? And uh, so that's relationships are this wonderful context for us actually to know God. And it's a lot easier to love God because he's perfect. It's hard to love uh, others because we're all imperfect. And so in that imperfection, then we get to see how God does it. Um, An amazing thing is God is glad to be with us. We are his desire. He longs to be gracious to us. He waits on high to have compassion on us. And so... Can we take that in, that God's desire for us is just amazing? Um, The other thing about 
what it means to be Christ's fiance is that because God so highly values us, that means we have a lot of value. So people may or may not like us or think highly of us or honor us, but the fact that God does uh, is amazing. And the fact that he looks at us and he says, you're my inheritance, means he has such a high value for us. That's amazing. Uh, Knowing that God chose us before the foundation of the earth, that he ran after us and sought us, that's just amazing. So we just like take all of this in about us being his betrothed. And as I mentioned before, knowing that our destiny is that we're going to be reigning with him for all eternity. So this is all stuff that's true. And can we take it in? Can we be informed by this to say, yes, I'm going to, um, I, I am... I feel this romantic love of Jesus pursuing us, and I'm just like taking it in. It's 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 amazing. Okay, so kind of going back to these five levels. As I said before, they build on each other. So As we move from servant to friend to son or daughter to fiance, it doesn't mean that we're still not, we don't worship him. It's just that Jesus is the king that we worship and our soulmate, both. It doesn't mean that, I mean, here's the interesting thing. In in heaven, it talks about all of us bowing down and worshiping uh, the king that's on the throne. And yet in another scene, there we are on the throne as co-regent with him. And both are true. Both are true that we worship him as our king, but that we're his intimate lover. So uh, the The thing I would observe about me is that I, especially early in my life, I felt the most comfortable being the servant because that was transactional in nature. This is what I'm going to do for you, God. God does some things for me. You know, I'm comfortable with that because I sort of felt like I was earning my spot. And, um, uh, but that's, so to, to say, well, am I really worthy to be his friend? Or do I really believe that uh, I'm a son who he's well pleased with? But especially the kind of intimacy that he'd have with me as his bride, it's hard to take that in. It's hard to take that in. And so there's, there's, I believe that in our walk with God that there's a a growth in intimacy that comes over time. And the most, the highest level of intimacy is that we're taking in the fact that we are his fiance. And that we're, that's where we live. So the last thing I want to um, address is um, a word to men and especially married men. All right, so uh, it's let's just face it, it's kind of awkward when you're a guy to view yourself as the bride of Christ. You know, I mean, it's just like, and you know, there's a lot of gender confusion these days, and we don't want to be part of gender, you know, so it's like. All right, how does, how, how do we like take that in? You know, when you're a guy of being the bride. So one thing I would observe 
about men is that we're called to love others. And if you're married, we're called to love our wives. And that is the hardest job on the whole face of the planet is, is carrying out his invitation that we love our wives like Christ loved the church. And that we lay down our lives for them and that we help them be the glorious women that God's created them to be. And um, that is, for me personally, no question about it. It is the hardest thing for me. It's where my weaknesses show up the most. It's where I experience my greatest failure, my greatest discouragement, and my greatest joy. I mean, it's, it's wonderful and it's hard. You know, uh, when I was watching Nathan and Victoria at the altar there, I go, I am so happy for them, and they have no clue what they're getting into. <laughs> and Eric, you're shaking your head, right? Because you've been married for a while, and you happen to know this. You know, it's naughty, it's wonderful, and it's hard. All right. So, isn't it interesting that the hardest thing in life is this picture of Christ's relationship with the church? Isn't that interesting? And um, so... uh, Here's a thought. Because it's so hard, the only way to pull it off for me as a husband is really study. Now, how did Christ love the church? How did he do that? How does he, how did he lay his life down? This whole thing about presenting her in his glory. How do you do that? So actually, it, constant this being confronted with my failures and my shortcomings as a husband continually reminds me man I got to study this whole thing about how Christ loves his bride so that I can learn how to do that but it's true and if you're not a married man here I'll expand this which you know there's quite a few people in the room here that that's we can all learn from how did Christ love us in terms of loving each other so um all right so we are running a little early that's good um, so, um, got some handouts here. Can you guys help again? Got more sheets than I need, but. All right. So, what we're going to do is break into uh, groups of four or five or so and uh, talk about this a little bit. And uh, so my first question is, when you think about those five different levels of intimacy in your relationship with God, kind of where do you see yourself? I mean, if uh, most likely, you know, we can experience different pieces of all of them but kind of where do you find yourself living most in terms of what you're thinking about? Or especially in terms of intimacy of relationship. So that's just kind of a check-in. You know, like, okay, I got these five different levels. Where do I tend to hang out? And then the second question is, what are practical steps that you might be able to take to go further up the line of increasing intimacy with God? You know, how can you work towards that level, especially of I'm Christ's fiance, and I'm really 
I, I so believe that, that I'm walking in it consistently, that I see myself that way. You know, sometimes we feel like an outsider, you know, <laughs> or, so yeah, so let's just talk about that uh, for a few minutes, break into groups of, uh, like I said, four or five people, and love to have some sharing going on. <laughs>